So we're going to prove now why composition of continuous functions are continuous. And we use this passing a limit through a continuous function that I put inside of a box. It's very useful, not just in the proof we're about to do, but it's very useful in general. You can pass a limit through a continuous function. So we're going to suppose, now let's get even lazier. This little half dollar sign means suppose. So that means suppose f and g are continuous at x equals a. I want to be a little more careful here, actually. So we need to be very specific about where they're going to be continuous. So uh, we're going to suppose f. So g is continuous at x equals a, and f is continuous at x equals g of a. This may seem a little strange, but if I write out what f and g are doing, so we're going to, what we want to show, f of g of x is continuous at x equals a. So what function goes first? If you feed f of g an x value, which function goes first? g of x. g of x. So you go inside, outside. So g is going to go first. So g and then f. So if we look at where a goes, so if g has input of a, f won't input that a value. f is going to input g of the a value. So first, our number a, our value a gets g'd, and then it goes to g of a, whatever number that is. And then that number, that value, gets f'd, and then goes over here to whatever f of g of a is. So that's why I need f to be continuous not at a, but at the input it's going to receive, which is g of a. So that may not be obvious before you think about g and E going first and F going second. All right, let's write down what all these mean. What does it mean for F to be continuous at G of A? So those we're trying to show, we'll put this inside. Oh, what does it mean? So let's finish what we're trying to show so we know our destination. So here we need to know the definition of continuous. So we want lim X approaches A. Whenever you're using a definition, if you know the definition, you don't need very many brain cells to write it out. So you either write it out correctly or you don't. There's really no in between. So lim f x approaches a of f of g of x equals what? Uh, f, uh, f of g of a? Yep. So we got our limit on one side needs to equal the value on the other side. So we got f of g of a. So that's what we're trying to show. It may take a little work to get there. So we're trying to show that the limit of f of g is the value. Uh oh. I want a. That should be an a. So what we're starting with, we're starting with f is continuous and g is continuous. We're going to write those two definitions out what that means. And then hopefully we'll be able to combine them together using algebra and show that it equals the value. So we're starting with what we know. All right, so that's what it means for g to be continuous at x equals a. So that should be incredibly obvious right there when you know the definition of continuous. So the other thing that we know, that was one fact we knew, well, I should say one fact we supposed, the other one we're supposing is f continuous at 
x equals, this is a little strange, g of a. Now, g of a is some number. So you don't want to think more into it than that. It's just some number. So that means lim x approaches. Now our value x needs to approach is now g of a. That's a little bit strange. This might be a good time to use a letter b to say that's whatever that value g of a is, we'll call it b. That might make your notes look a little nicer. So I'll write it out first with g of a, and then I'll write it with b instead of g of a. So we got limit as x approaches the right value of f of x equals, and over here we have to be careful, I'm taking g of a, the value we're approaching, and I'm plugging that into f. So it's going to be f of the x value, which is g of a, like that. So that might seem a little strange. If I write it with b's instead, that might make you happier. So I'll rewrite it. I said g of a is b, so wherever I see g of a, I'll just put b in its place. So you can use either one. You don't want to say times if you're talking about composition. All right, so G of F or whatever. So where you would put G in first, find what it and spits out, and then put that through F. And I didn't, today I didn't say what we're trying to prove, but yesterday, no, not yesterday, Thursday. the equivalent of yesterday, last class that I lectured in, uh, our theorem we're trying to prove is compositions of continuous functions are continuous. So we're trying to show that if F and G are continuous separately, if I go F of G, that would be continuous also. Okay. So, and we want to be careful about, uh, they're not continuous at the same x value. G needs to be continuous at a, and then f needs to be continuous at g of a. Right. For, this, for this reason right here, with the three uh, circles right here. Right. So they're not both continuous at the same x value. F needs to be continuous at the output of g. Well, if I don't know if f is continuous at g of a, I really can't make any conclusions. Just like think about a theorem, if uh, you don't know if I have food poisoning, what conclusion can you make from that? Nothing. So that if you don't know a certain supposition to begin with, you can't arrive at any conclusion. I think they call it junk in, junk out. Is one sort of slang term for that. Like if you don't know what you're starting with, how are we going to get to some conclusion at the end? All right, so we have two facts that we know, that we supposed, and we want to think about what we're trying to show. I can start on either side right here. So I can either start on the left side, the limit side, or I can start on the right side, the value side. And it doesn't really matter what side I start on because they're supposed to be equal. So this is almost like a trig identity, where you're going to start on one side, do a bunch of algebra and substitution until you get to the other side. And it doesn't matter what side we start on. Um, I see f of g of a, I see it right here. So I could just take that uh, and set that equal to the limit right there. But let's start on the limit side instead. So we're going to begin, so we're going to look at So eventually, we want this to equal, I'm going to put dot, dot, dot. We're going to do a bunch of steps. And this should, be at some point, be f of g of a. So this is our dream right here. So we want to eventually get down to there. We have a little work to do. Now what I wrote down, lim x approaches a, f of g of x. There's really nothing up here that helps me out in my supposition. So I'm going to scroll up a little further and use passing a limit through a continuous function property that we saw last class. So what I'm going to do is pass a limit through, now you have to be very careful, through the outer function, not through both functions. 
if you pass it through both functions, you'd be assuming they were, uh, that the composition was continuous. So I'm going to pass it through the outer function only. So the outer function is, in our case, f. So I'm going to pass a limit through f. So this is going to be f of lim x approaches a g of x. So with the blue marker, I just circled or squared, I shouldn't say squared, let's say circled uh, g of x and g of x right there. So if I scroll back up, it's just the input for your continuous function. So what was just x and x, instead of just being x now, it's uh, g of x, g of x. So I push the limit through the outside continuous function. And we're going to play the same game a second time. So push limit through G. So I push it past G. And of course, limit of X approaches A of X, that's the easy limit. That's just A. So I think I just did some cheating right there. So I haven't tried to prove it like this. I've used epsilon delta proof in the past, which I don't really want to go through right now. I'm worried that when I crossed from the first to the second equation, those were not equal anymore. They probably are, but I need to be a little more careful. I'm not sure. I'm just not convinced they are equal. Would you go make the same ones? Uh, well, by assuming continuity, you're assuming you're defined at the point. And you're also defined close to the point, or else a limit wouldn't exist. Uh, so you're assuming that it, there's a domain at least around that. Doesn't it necessarily have to be very large around that, but it needs to be something around there. I'll make some substitutions. Y is G of X. And we already said B is G of A. I'm just going to partition that stuff off that I'm not sure about because I don't think we can go right from the first to the second automatically. So let's change the names. So instead of g of x, we'll just call that y for now. Hmm. I don't know if this approach is going to work. I don't really want to go through the full epsilon delta proof. But you're more than welcome to if you want to. It's right at the end of 2.5.
it uses epsilons and deltas and some inequalities. It actually uses two deltas, and you take the minimum of the two. Uh, but I don't want to go through that right now. So what's, what's going wrong with this one example? Um, that, that, oh, that x that I tried to circle doesn't match that variable right there. So that should be an f of x if I was going to use that property. And what does passing a limit through a function do for you? Like it, does it make it to where you couldn't take a limit before and you could after? So right before this theorem, what we just showed is like polynomials are continuous, rational functions are continuous, um, you know, powers of continuous functions, or a power function is continuous, products of continuous functions are continuous. So what this says is, a continuous function of a continuous function is continuous. So now I can say, for example, y is why is this function continuous on its domain? Uh, I sort of just wrote that down quickly. I'd have to check what the do domain is, but there's basically two functions happening. There's a square root function and then a polynomial. So I could let g of x equal the outer function, square root x, and we'll go p of x for polynomial. So what is g of p of x? It's g of x squared minus 3x minus 2. And what does g do? g takes the input and squares it, uh, square roots it. So why is this function continuous on its domain? Because it is a composition of two continuous functions that are continuous on their own domains. So a theorem is universal in the sense that if you satisfy the hypothesis, you always know the conclusion is true. So if, I, if we sit here and go through 5,000 examples of different compositions of functions and, oh look, these 5,000 compositions of continuous functions are continuous, that does nothing to prove that all compositions of all continuous functions are continuous. Uh, so, I guess what I'm saying is, do we need to be able to prove that they are without the functions? Right? Uh, what you were attempting to do up there? Uh, so, if you're asking what types of questions can I ask you yeah. on a quiz or a midterm that, have, that use this theorem? Oh. So, you can push the limit through a continuous function, it's very useful. And on this, like the example I could ask you is why is this function continuous that's on the board right here in its domain? The answer is it's continuous because individually it's a continuous function of a continuous function. And that's why it's continuous. Okay, so it would be the reverse of what you were trying to say. You can use the theorem I give you. I'm not going to ask you to prove the theorem okay. that I give you. That's what I was asking. Is, are we going to be able to prove the theorem? No. Okay. Uh, not unless you major in math. And then somewhere in your junior or senior year, you'll do stuff called real analysis, which will look. You'll basically come back through all your calculus, and your calculus book, and work on the proofs of all the theorems explicitly. Okay. And you'll you'll get functions that are not polynomials or rational functions, and you'll have to show why that's continuous or not continuous. And you won't be able to just say, "Hey, look, here's a nice graph." You'll have to go through using definitions, and say. Oh, look, it satisfies the definition of cont continuity. Or, oh, this is why it doesn't satisfy the definition. Okay. 
All right, so this, I don't believe this stuff in here. So I'm gonna say, if you wanna see the rest, rest of the proof, just look in the book for proof, the proof of this. And like I said, if you don't, if that does not interest you whatsoever, you're probably not a math major. You're probably in here because you're an engineer or a scientist or got misadvised, if you're not one of those two. <laughs> I don't know why you'd be in Calc 1. No, there's some business people. You have to take business calculus for business. We don't offer business calculus, so they're here. Is that right? Yeah. All right. And fin finance is probably under business also, I assume. Oh. So most of you should be scientists or engineers. Maybe a couple, well, computer science is sort of a science too. All right. Oh, we're not quite in the next section yet. Don't. My dad did computer science. He did not get through calculus, so. Okay. I've changed since then. So let's do another example. So we need to pick the number b to make this function continuous. So if we look separately, if x is less than 2, we got a polynomial. And we saw polynomials are continuous on their domain. So I can already write down some things. f is continuous on negative infinity. I have to be careful up to 2. I can't go past 2 because it's going to switch from being x squared to a new function. If I, if I went up to and included 2, I'd have to say it's right continu or left continuous at 2. I couldn't make the claim that it's right continuous at 2. Because we have, you know, if this is like step 1 and that's step 2, I'd have, so this is like step 1 and then step 2 will be over there. So what I need to do is match them up. I could say that on the domain for step 1, we're continuous, including right continuous at the left continuous at the right end point but I'm not necessarily right continuous at I basically just need to show right continuity at 2 but I think it'll be easier to just look at just continuity at 2 and not worry about left or right it, need, it needs to be both continuous left and right full, full continuity alright so we know f is continuous on negative infinity to 2 because x squared is a polynomial Now, I can't use the fact that it's a polynomial to go past 2, because after 2, there's a new function. So I'm not necessarily sure that they're going to match up yet. And f is continuous on the interval, open interval 2 to infinity, because bx is a polynomial. The only trouble is, what happens, can I glue those two together nicely? And what we're about to do is pick the right B, so I glue them together and it works out. It would be two, correct? Because you want the B of X to be equal to X squared, correct? Two. X equals two is the value we're looking at, yeah. Right, so we want um, two squared is four, right? And then two times two. Well, you're jumping ahead. Let's think about what we need to show first before we worry about algebra and squaring stuff and all that. So the 
only thing missing is 2. So I need to show we're continuous at 2. It's pretty easy to write down the definition of continuity if you know it. If you don't know it, it's impossible. So I'll write out the full left equals right equals limit. So we're trying to show lim x approaches 2 on the left equals f of 2 equals lim x approaches 2 on the right. All right, I'll do the easy part. What is f of 2? Will be 2 squared. Now I want you right now to do the left limit and the right limit. Now how do they differ? Which piece do we use for the left limit? Piece 1 or piece 2? x approaching 2 from the negative side. So we're going to use the first piece because we're less than 2. And for the right limit, you're going to use the second piece. This is going to use the first piece. This is going to use the second piece. So go ahead and write down those two limits individually. And you're going to find out one of them already matches perfectly. So what does value does B need to have? Two. two. So we got four equals two B. B equals two. So there's our answer. So if B is two, then we got the limits match the value on both sides. And that's what it means to be continuous. If we really quickly graph this, x squared functions, easy to graph. I want to be extra accurate around 2 because that's where they need to match up. So we chose b to equal 2. So that means when x is greater than 2, f of x is 2x. Linear function, intercept 0, slope 2. Easy graph. Except we got to start at 2 and then graph it going to the right. So I don't really want to graph the left part of this function. So let me continue our squared function up here and I'm going to switch to a blue pen to graph uh, 2x, y equals 2x. So there's the rest of our function up there. Probably could be a little more accurate on the slope. So we picked the right linear function so that it matched up perfectly at the value. We didn't jump and like have a higher or lower y value after that. And I just used a dotted part to show that that's the functions are restricted. So this dotted part, we're not using those dotted parts. So the black function for part one or the blue function for part two. So any questions on that idea? So would it be wrong if you just put them equal to each other and put two into the parts to solve the beam? Uh, what do you mean them? So if you solve this for b, you'll get b equals, well, if you just solve for b, remember, you'll get either you'll get that. So somewhere you'll need to know x 
also equals two, which throws away which throws away that one and makes this one x equals, or I should say, b equals two. Uh, so if this is your answer right here, I will say you don't know what the definition of continuous is. Or if you did, you certainly didn't use it. Uh, so yes, this is, this is the last part of the answer, but why, like, why did you go here? So this leads to the right conclusion down here, but why did you start there? That's the important part that I'm going to give most of the points for. So why did I start there? Because this. And, then, and why did I use the x value of 2 is because I knew it was already continuous at all the other x values, because it was one, a polynomial matching another polynomial. So individually, they're continuous. I just need to make sure they match up where they're glued together. So that's why there's one bullet point, second bullet point, and that would be the third bullet point. So I said, make this function continuous on all x values, not just making continuous. If I said make it continuous at 2, you could skip right to the third bullet point that I listed right there, because you wouldn't care about it being continuous in other places. But if I said, why is it continuous? You know, choose B to make continuous everywhere. You need to say, why you, did you choose 2? Why didn't you choose 15? Because I know it's continuous at 15, because Bx, no matter what B I choose, that's a continuous function at 15. So. You need to know definition of continuous, and you also need to know why did you choose 2. Why don't you choose like 1 or 3 or some other x value? And the answer to that is because I knew it was continuous at the x values that were not 2, because it's polynomial and another polynomial. Does that answer your question? And so in calculus, this, if this is your answer, this does not impress me if you're in calculus class. This is algebra 1. If this is your full answer, this is an algebra one answer. So I need to know why did it come down to this right here. Almost every question that you do in math, at some point you're going to do algebra inside of it. If all I see is your algebra work, well, how'd you get there? Like, yeah, that might make your algebra teacher happy, but why did you know to start there? And so that's going to be worth a majority of the points. So what, what does it mean to be continuous, and why did you choose two? So like one of your midterm questions, it was what x value is it not continuous? Something like that, and then why? And so you had to pick the x value. Why'd you pick it? You had to explain, because hopefully you said something about limits, left right limits don't match, or the left limit doesn't match the value, or right limit doesn't match the value. So you have to know what does it mean to be continuous. Uh, so I'll give some points for the right x value, but then I want to know why. That's why there's a lot more space for why. The next theorem we have is intermediate value theorem. Let me label this. This is algebra work, but not worth many points if I was grading. So that's algebra, but all the calculus is missing. So the true definition between, the true difference between algebra and calculus is algebra is taking numbers and finding answers. Calculus is understanding why you start a place, why you do things. No, no algebra is manipulating symbols. Uh, usually inside of equations, and calculus is, calculus is looking at basically change over time. Okay. Uh, we haven't gotten into derivatives yet, but it's, there's a lot more definitions in calculus than there are in algebra. Uh, and then you can, arithmetic is the study of numbers, basically.
What's the fundamental theorem of arithmetic? Fundamental theorem of arithmetic. So you probably finished arithmetic somewhere in elementary school, maybe middle school if you took a leisurely stroll through arithmetic. Every number factors out the same way into primes. So if I give you a number like 25, we're both going to factor it the same way down to primes. Well, 25 is really easy, but maybe uh, 12. No matter what way you factor it, when you get down to primes, we better have the same primes or you didn't factor it the right way. So 12 is like 2 times 2 times 3. No matter how you, if you went 2 and 6, or if you went 3 and 4, you're going to eventually get to 2, 2, 3. So that's fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Fundamental theorem of algebra is every polynomial factors over complex numbers. So I'm, that's not the definition of algebra and arithmetic, but that is uh, an important property, or important theorem in both of those two subjects one that everybody likes to forget because it says fundamental, so it's probably overrated. Are there people that actually like study arithmetic? Not in the sense that you've studied it. I mean, everybody studies arithmetic at some point in their life. I meant like so they, in a scientific way. Or yes. Uh, they look at, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of research into primes, prime numbers, factoring. That's how all encryption is done on the internet and in other places. Uh, so there's plenty of people looking at properties of numbers, absolutely. Um, now that leads into lots of algebra, and there's a lot of other theorems that come in to help you make statements about numbers. So yes, there's plenty of people looking at numbers. Uh, nobody is studying, uh, we know all the properties of addition and multiplication. Those are very easy to write down. There's, you know, commutative, associative, distributive, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like, the basic rules are very well understood. But the question is, you know, how far apart uh, are primes? That's a really big question. Um, and there's some uh, sort of estimations, some bounds, but those are actively being studied right now by lots of people. All right, Henry Valley Theorem. So we're going to write if A, then B. So you want to think every theorem we write, if A, then B. Hypothesis implies conclusion. So what is hypothesis? It's whatever follows if up to the word then. So if, make sure we write this correctly, if f is continuous on the closed interval a, b, and y not is between f of a and f of b, Then, there exists a C in the interval AB such that F of C equals this Y not value. So this backwards E is there exists. And that's the end of the theorem. So let's draw a really quick example of, to give you some intuition for this. So this example is not why the theorem is true, this is an example of how can I apply this theorem to this particular function here. All right, so just look at the graph, continuous between A and B. Any places the limit won't match the value? Nope. Now, what happens outside? What happens if you look, if you're at B and you look to the right? This theorem doesn't care. What happens if you're at A and you look to the left? Theorem doesn't care. Doesn't matter. 
So something might be happening, or maybe this entire graph, and that's the end. Now, I'm allowed to choose any y not between fa and fb. So any y not, let's say uh, maybe this one, that's between the two y values. So the th theorem tells me there's, there exists an x value, c, such that it has a y value that I just labeled right there. This particular function happens to have three different x values that have that y value. And I just labeled them all right there. What this theorem doesn't tell you or doesn't help you with is telling you exactly where those c values are. So it just says, hey, they're going to be there. Or I should say, there'll be at least one there. But it won't tell you wh where it will be. So I wrote f is continuous on the interval a, b. So there exists c on the interval such that f of c equals that y not. So what you don't want to try to conclude from this theorem Hey, look, there's an intercept on our graph. The theorem doesn't help you get that x-intercept because we use, is, so if this one right here, let's say that's y equals 0, is 0 between fa and fb on this graph? No. Certainly isn't. So if I pick that y value, I cannot use the intermediate value theorem to say there's a y value down there. There is something I can do. If I picked a different b, so what if I somehow figured out, oh, look, there's, um, there's actually two, y or two x intercepts on this graph. But if I went and said, oh, well, make that one b. Then I can use the intermediate value theorem. Well, it's continuous from a to our new b. And that y value is between fa and fb in this case. So if I change my b, um, it may not be easy to find maybe the minimum point. That's, we'll get into that when we get to derivatives. But if I can just figure out a b that's negative, that has a negative y value, I could then say there's an x-intercept between the two. So if I want to get that y value, I need to pick either an a or a b, one positive, one negative. And then I can say, oh, look, in between, there's got to be a 0. So does this not actually give a, a value? It just tells you. We won't really necessarily know where c is unless we get algebraically lucky and we can solve it out. Maybe it factors nicely. So I want to show there's a solution of this equation between x equals 1 and x equals 2. So obviously, we're going to use the intermediate value theorem because the first example that follows intermediate value theorem. But if you don't know that this follows the intermediate value theorem, what do you think you would try first? Factoring. So try your algebra skills out, right? Go for it. I think the only thing you really have a shot at is uh, rational zero theorem. Plus or minus one. So if you put plus one, you get one minus one minus one, not zero. Minus one. That'll be minus one plus one minus one, also not zero. So trust me, every algebra tool you have is going to break here. You're not going to be able to solve this with algebra. Even if you think you're good at algebra, you can be the best at algebra. All your algebra tools are going to break here. So intermediate value theorem, 
Well, first of all, we need a function. So what should our function be? You're thinking too much. There we go, x cubed minus x minus 1. Right, intermediate value theorem, we need a function. I need two x values, and then I'm going to pick a y value between the other two y values. So we're going to use the intermediate value theorem. So let f of x equal x cubed minus x minus 1. Y is f continuous. So we want to go between 1 and 2. All right, fill in the blank to make this sentence true. It's like Mad Libs with plus logic. <laughs> it's a noun. Polynomial, right? It's not a terribly difficult function. It's a polynomial. We know all polynomials are continuous. So this particular one is continuous at least between 1 and 2. It's actually continuous uh, infinity and negative infinity. But we only need it to be continuous right here. What else do I need? I need basically two y values now. So where do I get my two y values? I need to know what is f of 1 and what is f of 2. This is pretty easy. 1 minus 1 minus 1 is negative 1. f of 2 is 8 minus 2 minus 1 is 5. So I got two y values. So intermediate value theorem, I just need to pick a y in between these two y's what y value should I choose? Choose zero. Is zero between negative one and five? Yes. Yep, certainly is. Is between f1 and f2. So we're going to use intermediate value theorem, but we're going to be lazy and just write by IVT. So that's the intermediate value theorem. If I scroll back up, what is the hypothesis? Continuous, check. And our y value is between those two y values, check. So we're good. We're using intermediate value theorem. There exists a C. a C in the interval 1 to 2 such that f of C equals y naught, which was 0. And what is f of C? That's very easy. Just put in C, C, wherever you see x and x in our original. Uh, f of x there. So here is our solution, this value c. What the intermediate value theorem did not tell me is where in between 1 and 2 can I find this number. So it doesn't tell me what number c is. Only thing I know is between 1 and 2. So I don't know exactly where C is, except for the fact that's the only information I know. It's between 1 and 2. I don't know where between. So that's, it doesn't narrow it down too much.